So I'm going to talk about, um, and the last time I saw this was on the tarmac this morning too, by the way, from two years ago. So I'm going to talk about uh, an experience uh, that I'm having. Um, <laughs> and it's about, it's about um, a fishery that we have in the, in the southern part of Australia called the Southern Shark Fishery. Most people know this fishery because it provides uh, flake to Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania for what is commonly known as the Friday night fish and chip market. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty important product. Um, the fishery itself um, operates from the New South Wales border right around to the uh, South Australian West Australian border. Um, and the predominant species are gummy shark, school shark, which is um, conservation dependent listed now, um, and there's some bycatch species like saw shark and uh, elephant shark. But recently we ran into some problems, and you probably all know about it. Certainly haven't got a social license for it yet, that's for sure. Um, about this area here, the fishery itself began to interact with uh, a threatened species of mammal known as the Australian sea lion. So a lot of focus was thrown onto the fishery and the kind of activity that it was undertaking and what was going to be done about it. So um, you could say that my world was turned upside down fairly quickly and a lot of the investments that were made in this fishery over the last 30 years in order to build it up into um, a very sustainable stock of gummy shark was in, in overnight, overnight was in, in threat of collapsing um, and in fact is today under enormous financial pressure but we are undergoing some, some pretty radical change and we have some, some, some pretty, good, um, pretty good people to help us change. So the fishery operates predominantly with this method which is gill netting and the thing with gill netting is it has some really good attributes. Small fish swim straight through and big fish bounce off the net. And what that means is that you're only taking a certain size of shark, um, which allows breeding and populations to continue to grow. If you get the amount of shark that you take out of the water right, it can have some pretty spectacular results. So the facts about gill netting are these. The good, which is the primary good, is that the selectivity of the, of the, um, of the method itself has meant that in the report that Alona was talking about, that this particular species has a biomass um, which is over 70% of all the reference points, which is incredible, really incredible. So it just goes to show you the effectiveness of being so selective on the, on the size of the mesh. The bad, well, they're not so good. I don't want to sort of use the word bad. I'm trying to learn from the little tassel thing here. Um, is that anything that gets caught in these nets generally dies. Okay, so that, that leads us to other issues. And of course, the Australian sea lion has, has been the, the species of, of um, mortality interactions that we're not really, not really dealing with that well. However, we put an action plan in place. So we have to improve. We had to improve. Um, we must improve in order to survive. So we recognise this as being a good opportunity to sort of go back out to the community and say, look, okay, we know that we've got a problem, but we want, to deal, we want to deal with it in a way where we can maybe even become better or maybe open up um, some dialogue which will assist us in improving to a point where we can not only operate as a gillnet fishery in those areas where we don't have interactions with um, threatened or endangered or protected species, but we might be able to change in the areas where we do have those interactions into something different. So it took a little bit of thinking and um, uh, the results of what we've um, thought about are sort of going to be published very soon, but you're going to get a little bit of an insight to it here. So we developed this program. What did you call that before, that, that analogy or whatever? There was, a, there was a word for it. Anyone know when you develop a, a, a word? But anyway, we call it fish and go, which is close to fish and chip, you know. So, and, and what that stands for is fishers, ENGOs and government. And this is a little bit along the same themes as what we've been speaking about here. We've engaged we decided that engaging these different groups together in one room could be beneficial for us. But it's a big challenge because I'm squarely on the fishing industry side and we've seen um, governments, um, managers and environmental non-government non organisations as being, has, have, have been seen as being, you know, I don't know, against us or negative. We've always felt that we're always under pressure as an industry. So there had to be some sort of 
willingness to come to the table. So we sort of put this little spin on it and we call it, we're going to put an action plan, we're going to call the project Fish and Go. So what did we have to do? We unified fishers. In other words, the fishers of South Australia had to get together and sort of say, look, it's time that we stood together and went and spoke with one voice to our manager, to the community, to the people that mattered in the issuing of the social licences, to our um, research corporations, and we called in, and uh, we called in the ENGOs, which I call the cavalry. We, <laughs> we went to the government and requested change. It was very important. So the big boss is here, James, and he knows how upfront we've been about coming forward and saying, look, we want to change for better. Um, we appointed an environmental liaison officer to try and help us understand how to uh, deal with the NGOs and how to engage with the NGOs and how to better understand what the social values were behind change in for the better. Um, we appointed a biologist, which is really important because he helped us understand what it means to um, uh, mitigate interactions with all kinds of species, whether they're alive or whether they're not. Uh, we attained support from our research corporation, which is the corporation that Patrick leads, and this was really important, but we attained support from a major retailer. It, it, that said from a V major retailer, but the spelling mistakes have been taken out, thanks to Robert. Um, so that major retailer also recognised that we were willing to change, and we were potentially going to provide a much better product out to the community through the retail chains if we could come up with some solutions. This has all been driven by industry, although the pressure came from the government and the NGOs and the socials. So our new direction is, is pretty much an old one. I mean, um, anyone that knows about fishing knows that from the dawn of time, fishing with lines has, has been a, a pastime that not only the public takes up, but also the professional industry and uses it as a way to harvest the stocks. And we looked at going back to long lines as a potential way to mitigate the interactions of animals that you would get into the nets. So it's pretty hard to sort of catch a sea lion or a seal or a dolphin on a long line. Uh, and if you do, it's generally alive, so you can sort of cut the line and, and leave it free. So we thought that if we could somehow um, trial and test the, the, the method of long lining with the advent of new technology, because it was stopped many, many years ago in the shark fishery because of what, what we were doing to the school shark stock, um, maybe we could come up with new ways to sort of conserve um, the, the stocks of the school shark by letting them go alive, and we could certainly lower the, the interaction rates of uh, Australian sea lions in that, in that um, far west South Australian region. The outcome so far, um, and we're in the middle of the trials, and as I said, the results will be published very soon, the outcome so far has been quite interesting. We think that we're going to get a better fishery out of it. We, <laughs> we think, that, that was funny. <laughs> we, we, we think that every shark that is going to be lying caught has got, we will have the opportunity to release and 90% of them will be, will be uh, alive. And, and what we did there was that Woolworths, who helped us fund this project, gave us some money to buy these, um, I was talking to Alona about it at lunch, um, buy these satellite tags. And they were like $5,000 each, these tags. So you'd sort of stick them into the back of a, an animal and you release the animal after you catch it and you let this animal swim around for as long as it can swim around for before it gets gobbled up by something. And this tag sort of gets spat out the other end of the animal that gobbled it up and the tag sort of pops up to the top of the ocean and it beams all this information back to a satellite and that information goes back to those biologists and scientists and research corporations and then about you know, six months later, I get this little bit of paper in front of my, on my desk and it says, uh, this school shark was caught off South Australia um, within an Australian sea lion zone, which you're not allowed to go fishing with a gill net. We released it and it was caught like on the east coast of Tasmania. So it was giving us some really valuable information that not only can we go hook fishing, but if we decide to release a large female shark that's got young inside of her, she can survive. And that was really important for us to know because that means that you can go hook fishing that means that you'll be able to deploy hook fishing in areas where you can't go net fishing as an alternative to the net fishing and therefore continue to harvest the stock, which is above 70% of those reference points that we spoke about earlier. Um, and that would mean that we could actually bring some cash flow back into the industry and prob probably provide a better product. And I haven't even had a third of the time they've had yet, Patrick. <laughs> it's unreal. I'm nearly finished anyway, so suffer. Um, the big thing for us is that 
we can get some form of a certification if, if we can get the method of fishing certified because the stock of gummy shark is already at 70% of the reference biomass limit. So the stock is in fantastic shape. But it was, it's the method of gill netting in that particular area of the ocean, which is that far west South Australian region, which is preventing us from getting some real, um, some, some real you know, foothold on getting some form of a certification or some sort of a social licence from, from people like Michael over there. Um, and of course we have to deal with the school shark issue, but re releasing a live is important. So we see that this ability to gather the data and change has given us an opportunity to certify, which becomes an opportunity to clarify, an opportunity to clarify to the public um, and give us some sort of stamp of approval that um, this fantastic product that we have on Friday night with our chips and potato cakes and dim sim and have done so since the dawn of the Roman Empire um, is not going to disappear on us because we unfortunately interacted with some strange sea lions. So the non-target species can be released alive and I think they swam through before so they were quick to get out of the room. So in Australia, this particular product is already certified sustainable by the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership and also ABES. And this is the big one too, the fins. The fins are certified sustainable as well. So once we get that social license attached to the method of fishing, we feel that we can even become more legitimate on the global market and possibly go back to the people that have gone, that have gone under so much pressure to eating the fins and say, not only do we have a great fishery, but we have a fin which is totally certified. So there's some enormous global opportunities ahead of us. Um, and hopefully we can, we can release that report soon to everyone and hopefully all the news is good. Thanks very much.